To the Christians, he is Jehovah. In Persia, he was known as Ahura Mazda, the brother of evil Aramis. In Egypt, he was Ra, or Osiris. The Greek myths call this entity Zeus, and in Rome, he went by the name Jupiter. This being, and his quote-unquote son, is commonly associated with the sun. Here an important distinction must be made, because many have noticed a correlation between the sun and Satan. Satan, or Set, is the god of the setting sun, and so therefore his symbol is that of a black sun, as opposed to his righteous brother, who is associated with the rising sun. It is far from uncommon for occultists to associate the sun with Jesus and Osiris, it is equally common for them to associate Jesus with Osiris. In mythology, just look for the guy with the crazy brother, and you'll usually find Jehovah. Of course, most Christians would find it hard to believe that they are engaged in the worship of Zeus and Osiris, maybe even taking offense to such a statement. Their god, the god of Israel, could never be compared to the Greek god Zeus. We're talking about God here not a promiscuous cartoon character who throws lightning bolts. But your own Bible does indeed spell out the truth of the matter. In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 11, we read, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. In this verse we read that the locusts, which appears to be a reference to an army of demons, have a king over them who is an angel. This angel, along with an army of locusts, arrive from an extra-dimensional place called the Bottomless Pit. The verse also states that this angel has names in the mythologies of the neighboring peoples. The Jews call this angel Abaddon, and the Greeks call this angel Apollyon. But Apollyon is what the ancient Greeks called Apollo, a sun god of Greek mythology. What the Bible has done is verified, at least in the eyes of Christians and Muslims, the actual existence of a god from the Greek pantheon. Is it likely that Apollo is the only Greek god that actually exists? Probably not. What's more likely is that many, if not all, the characters from the Bible have corresponding names in Greek mythology. But even though the characters correspond, the perspective of villains and heroes appears to have been inverted as though retold through the eyes of a modern-day Satanist. In Greek mythology, Zeus is the tyrant lord of Mount Olympus, who is promiscuous, jealous, and a rapist, whereas Prometheus, who is also Azazel and Lucifer, is the creator and champion of mankind, highly intelligent, and can easily deceive Zeus. Mythology isn't the only vector by which we can reconstruct history. Evidence of a more temporal form exists for those whose tastes are more technical. This evidence involves the manner in which ancient civilizations rose and fell. It also involves what and how much ancient man knew and when he came to know it. Ancient man, predictably, attributed their knowledge to the teachings of the gods. To modern scholars, this explanation as to where ancient man received his knowledge of architecture, agriculture, and astronomy is largely unsatisfactory. But it appears that the ancients' explanation was no more of a cop-out than the explanations of today's university scholars, who label everything that doesn't exist within their theory as a mystery. When it comes to the more tangible forms of evidence, Exhibit A would be the ultra-accurate map of antiquity. Map making, or cartography, is far more difficult than intuition would suggest, and the days when maps were wildly inaccurate are all but forgotten. With today's satellites, hammers, and aircraft, producing an accurate map of a particular region is as easy as taking a photo. But in ancient times, 
without the advantage of modern technology, drawing up an accurate map of a given region was nearly impossible. The problem lied in the fact that the map maker had no way of knowing precisely where he was. This meant that determining the true distance between two points was difficult, and this resulted in a map of disproportional dimensions. Another hindrance to producing an accurate map is Earth's natural curvature. Because of paper's cost and portability, it's understandable that people would be inclined to draw maps on paper. Paper is, however, a flat two-dimensional surface, whereas the Earth is a three-dimensional curve. This means that even with the best of equipment, a paper map could never properly represent the surface of the planet. For example, looking at a modern map of the globe, one will notice that Greenland, the massive, frosty island between Canada and England, will appear disproportionately large and may even compare to the continental United States in size. Greenland is not the size of the continental United States, but on a flat map of the world, the regions near the North and the South Pole appear stretched. Although there are projections that could avoid such stretching, no two-dimensional surface could ever properly imitate a three-dimensional surface. With all the complications involved with ancient map making, it is indeed curious that maps of modern accuracy existed greater than 500 years ago. The first of these wonders is the Piri Reis world map, which was compiled in 1513 by the Turkish admiral Piri Reis. The map, according to Piri Reis, was compiled from a number of pre-existing maps which he described as quite ancient. For centuries, it appeared that the Piri Reis map was terribly incorrect in its depiction of the shape and size of Antarctica. In 1949, however, a joint British and Swedish expedition set out to survey Antarctica and ascertain what the southern continent looks like below the ice. Later, in the early 1960s, it was noticed by a man named Charles Hapgood that the Piri Reis map depicted the Atlantic chunk of Antarctica, not as it is in modern times, but instead showed its profile before it was enveloped in ice. The paradox is that, according to Orthodox history, Antarctica has been frozen over for 6,000 years, at the very least. Piri Rees readily admitted that his map was in fact a compilation of pre-existing maps. So how did those previous cartographers manage to accurately describe Antarctica's true shape beneath the surface of its ice? With Antarctica having been first discovered in 1820, allegedly, why did these early map makers describe the continent of Antarctica at all? Another world map, compiled by the cartographer Arantius Phineas in 1531, not only depicts Antarctica's true form beneath the ice, but it also illustrates where particular mountain ranges and rivers would be. Stranger still is the map's incredible accuracy regarding Antarctica's location relative to the southern tips of Africa and South America. How was an accurate map of Antarctica, including her location, hinterlands, and true form beneath the surface of the ice drawn up 300 years before Antarctica was supposed to have been discovered? There are other maps that include Antarctica, aside from the Rees and Phineas maps, before the continent was first spotted. These maps too are admittedly compilations of far older maps as stated earlier, making maps is no easy task. It requires surveying equipment and advanced mathematics. The bottom line is that the necessary knowledge and equipment was simply unavailable to these early cartographers. So where did the inspiration for these maps originate? The pyramids of Egypt are easily the most alluring monuments on the planet. Yet it isn't their grandeur alone which tempt their visitors, it is the mystery of their creation. These massive structures surpass even the most grand architectural creations of our day, yet, according to Orthodox historians, the Giza pyramids are around 5,000 years old. Despite their grandeur, they are lacking something that the grand never lack, an elaborate and fanciful